we're live. Well, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos, bonjour. Glad to have all of you here in this 36th week of Cultivating Voices live poetry today with our new books showcase featuring poets whose books came out just before or, or, or during the pandemic. I'm your host, Sandy Ano, and I'm the author of Boats Women from Salmon Poetry. Amazing to have you joining us today live from what I affectionately call our Zoom Poetry Studio, or those of you who are watching us live on Facebook. For another reading, as I mentioned, our 36th continuous week, for a reading that I've truly, truly been anticipating for months. Well, before I introduce today's dynamic trio, um, a, a little bit more about Cultivating Voices live poetry. As I mentioned, we began at the end of the, um, oh, I, I always say the end of the pandemic. I think that's a Freudian wishful thinking slip. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic in late March in response um, to the shutdown. And we've developed into an international, intersectional, intergenerational poetry community um, through our Facebook group with over 2000 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings between a live open mic. We have eight readers, 10 minute sets each. Signups are on Thursdays on those weeks and a new book showcase, three or four readers, 15 minutes each. It's by invitation, but if you are a member of Cultivating Voices Live, you can request a reading. And we occasionally have a special event. So please always double check our monthly schedule at the end of each week's event page. Well, now to today's poets. I'll introduce each before they read and then return to introduce our special guest poet at the end of our features. Um, and a reminder folks that this is a new book showcase. So we certainly hope that if you have the resources, um, you will purchase at least one collection today from, um, from our readers and we'll be sharing links to their presses with you during the reading. Well, first joining us today from Pittsburgh is a poet who has been a model of poetry citizenship for me for years. Um, I've known her work, her poetry, and also her work as the host of the public radio poetry program Prosody for, for many, many years. And it is an, an absolute delight to be able to have Jan Beatty joining us um, reading from her sixth book, The Body Wars, which was published this year, 2020, by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Jan is the winner of the Red Hen Nonfiction Award for her memoir, American Bastard, which is forthcoming in 2021. For many years, Beatty's worked as a waitress, an abortion counselor, and in maximum security prisons. She is a professor of English and director of creative writing at Carlo University. She is also the director of the Mad w Women in the Attic Writing Workshops, and this is an anthology from that project and is also the distinguished writer in residence of the Carlo University MFA program. Her fifth book, Jackknife, New and Selected Poems, won the 2018 Patterson Poetry Prize. Would you please join me in welcoming Jan Beatty. Thanks to everybody. Um, thank you, Sandy. 
really, thanks to Sandy Yanone and Elizabeth for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, and as Sandy said, we go back a ways. I remember interviewing Sandy on Prosody. And, and as, as we said earlier, Sandy gave me the copy for the, uh, the title for my uh, third book, Red Sugar. Um, more accurately, I stole it from her when she was reading. <laughs> so, um, so there you go. But I owe a debt there. And um, so thank you for inviting me and happy to read with Don Krieger, Lauren Russell and Destiny Jones. So this is a great, a great day. Uh, so I'm going to get started. I'm going to read from The Body Wars. Um, this is uh, this is The Body Wars here. And um, you can see it's hanging on the wall in my dining room, <laughs> um, a painting by Michael Letenero. Who, he's a great artist if you get a chance to look him up. So I'm going to start with the title poem, The Body Wars. I walked into the woods bleeding. I left the town and mourned. Midnight in Alaska, still light, and I was alone, walking into the Sitka woods. It had been one year since I'd bled and longer since I'd fucked anyone. I was propelled forward into the thickness, into the needles and dirt of Sitka spruce, and stupidly, not even afraid of bear. My father, the person I clung to, needed to stay alive had died six months before. He was the only one who made sense in my body and his leaving was the impossible thing. I didn't yet know my own wars and how to name them. So during my father's sickness, when I stopped bleeding, the gynecologist said, well, it's stress. And did I know that in World War II, the women paratroopers stopped having periods? I was stunned by his directness, intensity, earnestness. You are in a war, he said. I didn't know what to do with that. And so I got on a boat to Alaska. The Alaska Marine Highway slept on the deck until I froze. Then the shipman gave me a hanging bunk and slipped me food from the cafeteria. They said, you can sleep here, but watch out for the bow thrusters. I had no idea what they meant until the sound burst open and my birth swayed and it was time to get off. It was a time of great changes. And days later, I'm wandering the woods at midnight, feeling lost and found in this Northern place. And it was there I felt the blood start to move, felt a rising and falling and the stream down my leg and I cried in the forest alone for my beautiful father gone too soon, for myself and all my ignorance, not even knowing my own wars, the ones already fought or the many to still come. So I have a couple um, sort of New Mexico poems. Uh, I know there's some people from New Mexico here, at, um, Destiny um, for one, but so this starts out with a, um, with a quote from John Muir. These are his words. It never occurred to me until this storm day while swinging in the wind that trees are travelers in the ordinary sense. Storm day. I'm in the desert reading about the Sierra Nevada forest, thinking of storms. My astrologer said it wasn't my job, but the three colliding transits making me crazy. All these daily lightning strikes are wearing me down. And when I read John Muir, I ask, am I waving or bending? He talks about the madronios with red bark and large glass leaves, and I become smaller and made full at the same time. What would it be like to be stormless? It wouldn't be life. And the sea waves on a shelving shore would sink into flatness. Truly, it's the floating dropping in so deep that I love. Like when Muir enters the song, the trees singing and talks about the annihilation of years, what could be better? 
He says, I suddenly recognized a sea breeze as it came sifting through the palmettos and blooming vine tangles, which at once awakened and set free a thousand dormant associations. Where were they, those thousand? The air full, the instant of opening, the leap immediate, those thousand romantic moments of a life. And he said that now he was a boy, that now all the in intervening years had been annihilated. Beautiful minute, oh minute of gone years. So this, this next one, um, you'll recognize, I mean, it's on the anniversary of Charlottesville and you also recognize how dated it is, even though it's in a new book and um, so much has happened as, as we know. Um, on the anniversary of Charlottesville, cooler today, 81 degrees, there's a storm moving through Alamogordo and Ruidoso. What beautiful swirling in these names, Lupe, Obadiah, Slade. Radio says a tornado hit Eagle Nest, north of Taos, ski country. Hasn't happened in 10 years. Spike Lee's being interviewed wearing a thank God for Bob Mueller t-shirt, wildfire tornadoes slam the West and arsonists are burning people's lives. NFL players kneeling and raising their fists, thank God, on this anniversary of Charlottesville. State of emergency declared in Virginia, please don't let anything happen. It's National Lion Day and the sun will be bloodied tomorrow. The moon in Leo and how did we thrash back to the 60s race wars or we never left. Moon opposes Mars, squares Uranus. Solar eclipse in these mountains, headaches for days, I can feel the changes. Spike Lee's The Black Klansman releases today. He said until the US owns that it was founded on genocide and slavery, we'll never get better. And the world's in a fire tornado on Highway 60, up from Angel Fire. Deranged air, high winds, flash floods, hail yesterday in the I-25 corridor. In Cibola County, storms moving towards Roswell on its way out of the Milky Way, and even the alien heads on fire. Okay, so um, often I'm mistaken for a man and you know, that's okay, um, but, you know, I don't, I don't really see it, but, um, you know, I think people aren't looking, people are, 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 have these categories in their heads, I don't know, and I think it's probably short hair equals, <laughs> equals something. So this is called Crushing It, and begins at a Halloween party uh, at the university where I, where I work, Crushing It. Halloween, the pizza delivery girl said, are you dressed like a trucker? No, I said, I'm supposed to be a Western woman writer. Oh, she said, I like it. Someone else thought I was Eddie Vedder. Someone else, Tommy Morello from Rage Against the Machine. Maybe it was the ball cap flannel, but I was shooting for Pam Houston, dreaming of the bighorns. Like when the cab driver in Dublin said, you look exactly like Anastasia. She's a singer, she's beautiful, except she has long blonde hair. Then I crossed the road and the guy at airport security said, this way, sir. Once at the makeup counter in Macy's, I asked for some skin cream. The skin specialist stood a foot from my face and said, I'm sorry, sir, we don't carry that line. Pam Houston, where are you now? I know you like cowboys, but the big horns call me. It's wide open that I need where the big road snakes and cattle move so slowly. They won't even call me ma'am, sir, or Neil Young. I'm here 
in Pittsburgh, crushing on you. Thanks. So this is, um, I have a couple more. This is uh, like, um, as Sandy said, I used to be a social worker and um, used to work in maximum security prisons and abortion clinics and um, the welfare office. I mean, I, I was a bad social worker and I was, I was just not effective. I would just cry all the time. And, you know, that's not really helpful. <laughs> but, you know, so I, teaching was, is better. Not that it's stress-free, but it's, it's not as, uh, not as intense in those ways. So this is about uh, two women driving to DC for an abortion. It's called Hot in the Striped Boy's Heart. It's hot in the loading bridge, hot in the birth canal. It's hot in the striped boy's heart. We're two women driving to DC for an abortion in my beater sea green Le Mans with the sex, drugs and rock and roll sticker on the bumper. It's hot living in my car with a mattress in the back, the windshield wipers disintegrating and so it's raining all the way to DC and my friend is terrified, let it go too long with a guy she loves, but he could care. And she can't face her parents, borrowed money from the waitresses we work with, saline solution for a second trimester abortion. It's hot in the Silverman's t-shirt I'm still wearing from sixth grade with gold and blue stripes hot in the men's store buying my first real shirt with my girlfriend, Patty. I was a boy then, not yet a woman, following the sight lines from the silver hood ornament to the double yellow, hot in the Pontiac trunk of clothes and boxes and the cheap hotel in Silver Springs for the early morning procedure. Two women in their twenties, out of state for treatment, hot in this traveling altar, these bodies run amok, body of light, body of doubles, body of never telling anyone, never seeing her again. Hot in my striped boy's heart in this car, dragging home with no talk, still bleeding. Thanks. Uh, and uh, with this poem, I was born in a place called uh, Rosalia Asylum and Maternity Hospital. It was a, um, back then it was a place that they called the Home for Unwed Mothers, which is a, not a great name. And, um, and then it became an orphanage. So, you know, the babies were born there, then the, the women would leave and the babies would stay. So I was there the first year of my life. Um, far as I know. And, uh, and if you go online, you can see a lot of photos from this place. And they're pretty bleak. Uh, they're 1950s black and white photos. This one is called the playroom. It's not a good name for it. You'll see a metal carousel and these sort of drugged out babies hanging there. Um, so this is called uh, double cut. I was double cut once in the womb with a hanger, once when I came out. In the asylum, the hanging bulb of the playground kingdom birthed the hunger in me. Children staring in cast off tees, the paint chipped metal carousel with struck stupid infants strapped in. The golden girl sits in her dirty diaper. She'll grow up a poet loving suspension. You be the fat black crow, you be the driftwood. You be the poorest kid, dirty face. You be the crying one. You be the no name, strapped in and spinning. Okay, thanks. Uh, two more, this is uh, from my father who died many years ago. My father disappears into flowers. The apple tree in the backyard with white waterfall blossoms. 
my father's body disappearing in his sickness down to 90 pounds, his hat floating on his head. My father falling into the clothes rack, trying to buy smaller pants to fit. He's not gone. The air heavy with waterfall and him vaulting down the front steps in spring. And this, uh, thank you. This is my last poem. Uh, I was in West Texas a couple years ago in uh, have to go back. This is called West Texas Love Poem. Spread a map on the hood of your car and try to remember what you wanted. If you want to be seen as yourself, that might not happen. If you wanted the prize, the explosion, the magnificence, run your hands over the map, feel the softness of the paper, the engine heat, through the Guadalupe Mountains. Nobody promised you anything, and they shouldn't have. The mint green of the old map catapults you home, home, meaning wherever your hand is. The topographical blue lines make you long for old highs and lows, like they were something. Well, they got you here, to this car, this life. Straight in the corners near West Texas, Remember how goddamn lucky you are to be loved. Now get in the car and drive. Thank you. Thanks very much. Wow. You may not perceive that you had been a good social worker, but you are one hell of a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, I've known for years. I've known that for years, but I just want to say it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, glad you made the shift. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to seeing you the next time I can get myself to Pittsburgh. Yeah, get in touch. <laughs> Absolutely. I will. All right, friends. Uh, the link to Jan's book, you've, you've just heard the extraordinary poems from her sixth collection, The Body Wars, is in the chat. Um, please waste no time, add that to your collection. And uh, our next reader really, really needs no introduction to Cultivating Voices members. Um, because Don Krieger is a person who has been weekly making Cultivating Voices live poetry happen from behind the scenes. And we, it is not an exaggeration to say that we would not be able to do the reading series without his generosity and time. So I, hope that you can appreciate how uh, special it is for me to be able to welcome Don to introduce him and support him in celebrating his new book, Discovery. Don Krieger is a biomedical researcher whose focus is the electric activity within the brain. He is a 2020 creative nonfiction foundation science as story fellow. His work has appeared in the American Journal of Nursing, Neurology, Seneca Review, the Asahi Shimbun, the Blue Nib, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, and others, as well as in several anthologies in both English and Farsi. Would you please join me in welcoming my dear, dear friend and solid, solid, solid compatriot in poetry, Don Krieger, and congratulations on your new collection, Discovery. 
Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> see. The picture on the cover, uh, let's see, I think you can see it pretty well here. Yeah, great. Um, it goes with a haiku, the opening haiku in the book, and also with the, the first poem I'll read. Bright night sky, great migration, streets on fire. That familiar comfort. The river at Port Chicago was pink in the dawn glare. Strangely like that night, they fled for their lives. Biplanes spotlit by burning buildings, kerosene bombs bursting on the roofs, clubs and rifles, white boys and their fathers, Beasts hunting little Africa for black runners. Do you know this story? The Tulsa pogrom of 1921. 6,000 black people jailed. No whites. The Greenwood ghetto burned to the ground. No insurance ever paid. No crime ever charged. The dead uncounted. I never knew it till today. I bear that shame, small price for my privilege. From this day, I forswear that familiar comfort, the cowardice of forgetting. By way of introduction, this poem is from a collection written by Denise Levertov in 1970 for his, her students, um, Don. If the body is a house, the house a temple, in that temple is a labyrinth, in that labyrinth's core, a vast room, in the room's remote depths, an altar, Upon the altar, a battle raging, raging between two angels, one feathered with spines, with sharp flames, one luminous, the subtle angel of understanding. And from time to time, a smile flickers on the face of the mean angel and slips shadowy over to the gentle face. Dream Street, this is a Pittsburgh poem. I left her the house and got a place on Torley. Each night the neighbors put chairs on the sidewalk, turn the TV face out, drink Iron City, and watch the kids play in the street. I get home from work at six or 10 or two, shower and then sleep with eyes open. A child shrieking on a hospital gurney, her spine flayed and straightened, the smell of burning in my hair. A new mother life flighted from the mall brain shifting in the scanner, crushed by bleeding while we watch. We drink coffee and wait while a father facing doom in our hands says goodbye to his children. Each day I pedal in over the Bloomfield Bridge or drive when called at night, never dreaming what will come next. Standing by, I moved the piano from the basement, had it repaired and tuned. She bought a lovely stool with claw feet. I fixed the seat with a deerskin cover. She never practiced, though, told me, 
Grandma always looked at me so closely after my bath. Grandpa did something to me when I was learning to play. I paid someone to take the piano, then stood by while she struggled to remember. I broke out the concrete where a clogged downspout plunged into the foundation, fitted it with a clean out, formed a cement cover to protect it from the weather. One night she locked me out. I never understood, not that time or the others. I woke in the garage, chilled in the dark, my head buzzing like yellow jackets in the crumbling roof. It warmed me to think of her, our life together. I fetched the clean out cover and etched our names in its face with a rusted hanger. When she saw it, she said, it looks like a headstone. Soon after she had a stroke, then lingered. I knew her wishes and consented, stood by to see they were met. I still feel that I murdered. I still remember when last we spoke. We lay on the couch kissing. This was just dominated for a push cart. One in a thousand black men in America can expect to be killed by police. Edwards et al., 2019, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Strange days. I woke to the governor's stay-at-home order, Drew, drove the turnpike anyway. Each cop we passed, and there were many. I thought of my white Subaru and my skin like a thousand times before. <clears throat> Almost invisible for my sisters. <clears throat> In 1900, he was a tanner with a baby daughter a cigar maker in 1910, two infant sons, the daughter gone, the mother too. I found 10 death certificates, dates and addresses, causes, eight babies and the mother, all tuberculosis. The 10th was the father. He cut his own throat like they did in those days. Two. She climbed down the curb and wandered into traffic. I parked crosswise to block the road. She toddled to the other side, up the sidewalk, turned in with me behind like a herding dog. The screen door was locked, the house filled for Shabbos dinner, kids and arguing men in black. A pregnant woman came to the door let her in with a quiet thank you, locked the door behind her. I saw them again yesterday, two in a stroller, four more walking behind, the girls with baby dolls cradled in their arms. Three, she was alone, not so old as me, a ring and a bad wig. I felt that hollow leer before, but not so harsh, not so eloquent. Too many Sabbaths, too many births. Obia, a spiritual practice, origin, Igbo, Nigeria. He tapped small drums, a wiry man, with skateboard cross-legged on the summer sidewalk. I refused his plea for alms with a palm wave. Ah, he said, the curse, 
of the white man. In my dream, he lives in a concrete room without furniture or heat. He and his friends are watched and murdered, yet they are kind, make poems and music as some did at Auschwitz. I felt I had been there in that room always with him, my enemy. Then the bright light of morning washed through me with luminous privilege. This appeared in the uh, 50th anniversary issue of Seneca Review. I'll just read some fragments from it. Invisible for Susie. Mom wanted cremation to be spread on the sea. When I threw her to the wind, she tasted of tree bark. I was at work again when Rick called about dad this time with no plan. I asked him, please don't dump those ashes down a storm drain. We bought another plot, but not too close to mom. She despised him longer than any of us could remember. No one showed up but me. The cemetery salesman put the ashes in the hole and closed the cover. I gave him two twenties and asked, could we say Kaddish? Sure, he said, we have a minion and pointed to a funeral in progress. Her freshman year, Susie totaled the Corvair and my lark too, drunk both times. Her first husband was a hillbilly. The second had been a junkie. Whenever I visited them, he changed the channel to a sermon. One time I picked up a toy car. He shouted, don't touch that, and snatched it out of my hand. It was part of his diorama of the current NASCAR standings. Rick called about Susie's memorial service, delayed a year for her preacher's return from China, hearing she was gone like that. No goodbye, no chance. Each day, I walk through the sports complex from the VA lot to my office, broken concrete, rust-stained ponding. I walk lightly and keep to the shadows, slowing if someone is ahead so she won't fear the man hulking behind her. I love the implacable weight of concrete, the forming, the astringent smell and heat of it as it sets, the dead cold when it's cured. The foundation of our Florida house was a slab ground glass smooth and level before they laid the block walls, set the hand crank casement windows and roofed it with concrete tiles. That terrazzo floor was perfect for shooting down army men with marbles and for growing up unheard and unseen. My second wife was often startled when I appeared till I began walking loudly, a choice so difficult we both knew it for an act of love. And the title poem, <clears throat> Our Shared Humanities. Nothing is deadlier, dogma. So beautiful, courage. Riskier, faith. Seductive, privilege. More noble and just, war more profane, indifference, crueler, God. No greater truth, kindness, 
nor greater lie, color, nothing more human, discovery. Thank you everyone for listening and for hearing. Thanks Sandy and thank you Lauren and Jan and Destiny for being here. Folks, you've been listening to Don Krieger's work from his new book, Discovery. And um, I'll just share, um, many months ago, Don and I were on a Zoom call together and he read me our shared humanity. And, um, you know, I just, I cried, I, I cried about, you know, and so, um, you know, I hear a poem like that and I'm affected, which is one of the intentions of poetry. Thank you, Don, again and again and again for sharing your humanity personally with me and with those of us here in the room today and on Facebook and later on video. And congratulations on um, this book that calls out history and humanity. Well, friends, I'm taking a breath there and shifting to our final featured reader in our new book showcase here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry. What, um, what, an, what a real privilege it's been for me to be connecting with Lauren Russell, um, preparing for this reading. She, Don was the one that drew me to her work, uh, directed me to her work, in fact, sent me her new book. It is a remarkable um, hybrid of personal and historical significance. I, I, I truly can't emphasize it enough um, how uh, moved I've been to read this book. Lauren Russell is the author of Descent from Tarpaulin Sky Press 2020, as well as What's Hanging on the Hush from Ashata Press 2017. Lauren is a 2017 National Endowment for the Arts Fellow in Poetry, and she has also received fellowships from Cave Canem and the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, as well as residencies from the Rose O'Neill Literary House at Washington College, the Malay Colony for the Arts, and City of Asylum, Pasa Porta. Lauren's work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Academy of American Poets, Poem A Day, the Brooklyn Rail, Cream City Review, Diagram, and the anthologies, Bettering American Poetry 2015, and Furious Flower, Seeding the Future of African American Poetry, among many others. She was Assistant Director of the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics at the University of Pittsburgh from 2016 to 2020. And this fall, she joined the faculty at Michigan State University 
where she is now the assistant professor in the residential college in the arts and humanities and director of the residential college arts and humanities center for poetry it is um, my true honor to welcome lauren russell to read from her new book descent and all i can say is thank you for writing this book Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you for the, the wonderful introduction. Thanks, Don, for inviting me. Um, and it's really such a pleasure to read with Jan and Don, and um, I'm, I'm excited to hear Destiny. So, so thank you, everyone. Um, my cat started making a tremendous amount of noise during that introduction. So <laughs> they seem to have calmed down, but if you hear some meowing going on, I apologize. Um, so Descent um, began, uh, the project began in 2013. I acquired a copy of the diaries of my great great grandfather, Robert Wallace Hubbard. He was a captain in Hood's Texas Brigade in the Civil War um, and went back to East Texas after the end of the war and had children by three of his former slaves who were also sisters. And as I was transcribing these 225 pages of diaries, I became really fascinated by everything that was being left out and um, spent years researching and writing into those gaps. So his name was um, Bob or Robert. Dear Robert, dear Redbeard, dear specter of the great white father, dear slaveholder, dear Confederate captain captured at Gettysburg, Dear dispenser of land, favor, semen, procreator of 20 children by three sisters simultaneously. Dear father of the Negro League pitcher. Dear farmer, schoolmaster, landlord, hired hand, grave paler, log roller, surveyor, and manure shoveler. Dear singer. Dear churchman and circus fan. Dear reveler at brigade reunions. Dear collector of sentimental poems about loneliness and redemption. Dear pointy eared like Lucifer and bearded beyond Rasputin. Dear mythical Jim Crow defier, hero of my grandfather's childhood, who took him on the whites only section of the streetcar. He claimed this really happened, proclaiming, these are my grandchildren and they're sitting with me. Dear diarist, dear widower, Dear lonesome hunger, dear admirer of well-formed women, dear inscrutable in the tin type beside your favorite half-claimed child, dear tallier of payments, debts, work days, weather conditions, neighbors by name and race, dear borer of wells, dear master of omission. Heard a whippoorwill holler this morning for the first time this spring. Heard a whippoorwill holler, all hands choking cotton. Heard a holler, a whimper. Heard a will whip her. Will heard a whip. Whip or will. Will heard, herding hers, whipping herds, sowing oats, whipping whores, stripping cane or Whelped her, willed her a well and a hold, dank of the dark of the hell of the hold, choking cotton, caught in, a yoke and a pull, stripped and caned for. Heard her holler, caught her, held her hand to the whipped out your, held her head to the whipped out the billfold. Heard a whimper this spring, choke door. Heard a holler, a hollowed out hold, whipped to a wheelbarrow, hell bent toward a hole, ripped from a, wrapped in a gut wrench sugar hold. Question. So how did the women feel about this? Answer. Don't guess they had no say. Um, this one starts with an epigraph. I have many a time been actually and painfully thirsty and yet in sight of an ocean of fresh water. 
Decima said Ultima Sparziza escaped POW. Johnson's Island, winter 1863 through 64. That winter, the pipes froze and no longer brought water in from the bay. The guards ordered the men to dig two holes about eight feet deep. They installed pumps, but still the water is always exhausted within an hour of reveille. He has forgotten to change his socks and his toes are freezing in their own sweat. The wind claws at his eyelids and lips. The ice is driving at him in spikes fearsome. And for a second, he thinks the wind is hammering nails into his face, that God Almighty is bent on paling his grave. But no, he is grateful for the warmth of the beard ought to wrap it around him like a scarf. It is almost long enough his thirst gravel in his throat, his ears tingling and then suddenly numb. Heard a whippoorwill holler, heard a holler, a whimper, a whirlpool, a snicker, heard a stag kick her. Long hours between roll call and roll call, he tries to rewrite his own history to erase the moment his ears popped charging a Pennsylvania hill. Whip em, boys, whipped or not whipped yet, how you begin to doubt your own head. A shell exploding ahead and even the screams of the man beside. You are muted like cries from the shore when you are holding your breath underwater. The lines of scattered mess of boulders, but you're yelling stand firm, why? The rebel yell issuing from your own spent breath, though you cannot hear, but for a moment think you will make it to the top despite gunfire hailing down the forest, a dizzying maze of smoke and half blinded retching. You run headlong into a tree before you are taken. How? Sword in the back, see yourself relinquishing your revolver over to a first lieutenant from New York, some retribution for second Manassas, the blue columns at Fredericksburg melting away. Look away, look away. The boy who disarmed him was younger than he, had curious auburn eyes that reminded Bob of some dogs he'd seen. My great great grandmother's name was Peggy. Peggy rises out of sleep through the dream called blue, where all her kinfolks are wading through fields of blue. Even her father left in Georgia, her stillborn brother somehow grown, her niece who stumbled into the fire on Christmas day and died with the vision of her white dress aflame. The aunt or uncle who ran off or was lost forever to the auction block. They are all wearing blue, blue hats, blue shawls, and in the way they sing a song with no words deep from the gut, there is also blue. And bluely she creeps toward them in her calico blue. And now there is a dance, they are partnering for the quadrille and the man they called Bo Peep cradles a banjo, strikes a tune blue. And her petticoat starched with hominy water and prisses too. And every time they stop moving for a second, the petticoats pop and Pris giggles and in Pris's eyes are flecks of blue. The log train shakes her into waking, black then dark blue. And she reaches for her kerchief blue and she is stumbling toward the cradle blue and cooing shoo shoo to the baby who is hollering now. One Sunday, the preacher prayed, Lord, let us all go to heaven where there'll be no log train. Hoo, 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 and a clinkety clank, whose black smoke curling into the half blue. Bob, can I be your lazy eye, your wander lust, your grave without a headstone, your bleeding gums, your buck teeth and your walk bow-legged at the knee? Can I be your fortune hunter, your glimpse of wild geese, your red russet shoes that poison the feet? Reckon this is the best 
of my seed, been stripping cane and blind, robbing the bees. Reckon you've thought of swimming the creek. Last night they came on horseback, white hoods like phantoms, scanning the trees, burning torches, shattering sleep. I dragged the shotgun from the door and stepped squinting onto the porch. I want to think that when the witness tree leaned into the ledge, it heard her heart stop between one breath and the next. The day they buried Peggy, all the trees were whispering, the chinkapins and loblolly pines. Did she miscarry, bleed to death? while Bob or Plunk saddled the horse, rode miles panting after the doctor in town? Did she recall her mother's 20 pregnancies and bite her lips, her tongue, the quilt, and finally the bedpost, lest her daughters hear her scream and come too close? Did she rage deliriously through the shakes, bloat from dropsy or hack through a consumptive fit? Or did she take her own life swallow strychnine or arsenic, hang herself from a beam, clench a shotgun between her teeth. Peggy sometimes spoke in whispers. Sometimes she did not speak at all, but just said, uh-huh, leaning hard on the last syllable or sure did with all her weight on the first. Sometimes, if Bob looked closely, he would see a thought blow across her face. Once he might have tried to squeeze it out, but a woman is not sugarcane. You can run through a mill, its secrets easily expelled. Peggy. Today, I plucked a whippoorwill from down the bottom of the well. Her neck was broke but still she hollered out her name. Get, the burst of freedom came in June. Go yon der way, I said. Once when she was 16, Peggy finished cooking the hominy and drew pictures with ashes left on the hearth. When the genographic project says I am more Scandinavian than African, I don't know how to feel about it. If I went to Denmark in this skin, this smoking cyclone crown of frizz, and declared the findings, who would they convince? I'm told I am more Scandinavian than African and wonder where this belongs in the half-built book I am no longer living in. Bob Hubbard was always gathering moss for the mud cat chimneys he raised over Polk County. A county surveyor knew where lines bent. Did he leave behind a genetic map? Bob came through and made everybody kin, one of my cousins laughs. From Emma Haynes' History of Polk County, 1937. When the camp was established at Moscow, every house was closed and Negroes paraded up and down the streets. The next morning, four Negroes were found hanging to a tree. The Ku Klux Klan would control the Negroes and did to a great extent, but the citizens were kept in constant fear of a Negro uprising. Oh, that people loved peace rather than war. In the book I built, where I no longer live, some nights hummings in the walls, not wind hissing through chinks, but a human song that shifts in sleep and dips into a low dip bong. Peggy. That moon ain't hiding, 
clouds as shawl, moons cold as brass tacked upside a night's frock. Pin your tears to her they'll sing like chimes or ghosts that cry. Sometimes I feel I'm almost gone. Ghosts charred in dead men's lust. Think I'm some fool, got brains of shucks. Since freedom, I've been through the toughs. See one moon casts your shadow twice, once toward the bottom land, once toward the pines. The wind's right smart, but moon, she sly. Look, lightning bugs, they spark, but they cannot catch fire. Thank you. Oh, Lauren, I cannot imagine the journey of writing this book, mine from that diary that, that you found. And, and I wish you a strong journey with moving descent further and further out of history and into the present. Um, you know, poetry reveals the power of stories and breaking the silence that is too often history. Um, thank you so very much for sharing. Thank you. Descent. Well, before we move to our special guest reader, I just want to invite everyone to unmute yourself for, um, if we can unmute for a moment and give a round of gratitude and applause to our three readers today, Jan Beatty, Don Krieger, and Lauren Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you. Three great readings. Three great readings. Yes, incredible. Indeed. Wow. Wow. Well, well folks, well, if we would remute ourselves, I will move us along toward our special guest that we have today. I am very happy to be welcoming Destiny Jones to read a poem that I heard Destiny read just this week when I was uh, listening to the open mic at the Cactus Reading Series out of Placitas, New Mexico, hosted by uh, John Roach and Jules Nyquist. I was absolutely wowed by, by Destiny's poem and I thought that you would be too. So I reached out, invited Destiny and to my delight, Destiny said, yes, I will come on Cultivating Voices to read that poem. A little bit about destiny. A little bit about destiny. <laughs> destiny Jones, she, her pronouns, has always been passionate about writing. And you will see this in a moment. But with this pandemic, she has been spending a lot more time honing her hobby. If you're interested in reading more about Destiny's work, you can find her poetry page, Poetess Destiny on Instagram. Would you please join me in welcoming Destiny Jones? Hello, 
Hello. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Sandy, for inviting me. And thank you again to Jan, Lauren, and Dawn for reading some of the most amazing work I've ever heard. I'm so grateful to be here and so grateful to have heard all that wonderful poetry. Um, just wow, you guys were all amazing. <laughs> thank you again for letting me be here. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so my poem, uh, I need to just give you a little bit of context before I start reading. Uh, I wrote it back in August um, and I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico and our um, the rules on our pandemic uh, at the time was that we could have indoor dining at 25% and outside dining at 50%. Um, and at the time, um, so that was kind of what was going on. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is because my friend was working at a restaurant that inspired this poem. And she, and I guess the restaurant owner had made a Facebook post stating that if you wanted to eat at the restaurant, you would have to wear your mask until you were seated inside. And if you had to get up to use the bathroom, you had to one, once again, put on your mask. And some people did not like that, uh, including this person, Jamie, who happened to write a text back to my friend who was, um, who had to initially uh, send a text to him first saying like, he, that she had to move his reservation from outside because it was rainy that day to inside. And he wrote back direct quotes, yes, cancel me, you're Nazis, wrong use of your, by the way. I will not wear a mask, your food isn't that good. So I decided to write a little poem about Jamie here. Um, and I've named it, Jamie absolutely asked for this and I don't feel sorry one bit. Dear Jamie, I'm sorry if we upset you by asking if you could please wear your mask until you remain seated. I'm sorry you didn't know there is a pandemic outside killing people, that it could be transferred through close contact by coughs, sneezes, talking, or any sort of droplet that comes out of that large hole in your face that you never shut, Jamie. Dear Jamie, I'm sorry you feel like you have no rights over what you can and can't wear when we told you to wear your mask until you were seated. I, as a woman, obviously don't know what that's like. It's not like they taught us in school that showing our shoulders wasn't appropriate because it would distract the boys from their education. It wasn't like we were taught that it was our fault if we got raped, if we wore skirts too short, that women only deserve respect depending on their attire. But I guess being told to wear a mask until you were seated is worse than that. Dear Jamie, I'm sorry you felt so oppressed for having to wear a mask. It's funny because I think of my brothers and sisters in rainbow leggings with pride flags around their necks and I wonder if they can relate. Probably not, after all. We only deal with being told we'll burn in hell for loving someone of the same gender, shoved in closets with our dirty secrets, either shot at a nightclub, sent to conversion therapy, or disowned and left to wander the streets because God turned his back on us. You must feel like he turned his back on you when he told you to wear a mask until you were seated in the restaurant. Dear Jamie, I didn't know you felt uncomfortable when we told you you had to wear your mask until you were seated. You hate it because it's hard to breathe, but nobody has a harder time breathing than you, not even George Floyd, when, a white, when, a, when he had a white officer's knee pressed against his neck. Not all black people have it as hard as you, as they hold their breath waiting for who's next. What officer is going to find them jogging, driving, standing, or breathing while being black? Who's going to stop them from breathing next? You must feel the exact same way, Jamie, what it must feel like to not be able to breathe. Dear Jamie, I'm sorry that you felt like you, you were treated wrong, that you, that you felt like we were Nazis for making you wear your mask until you were seated. I didn't know you felt that mistreated, like we hold you up in a concentration camp, that we worked you to death in leaving you malnourished, that we shoved you and your loved ones in a gas chamber, that you had to watch them as we snuffed them out like it was nothing. I'm sorry we didn't know you felt that mistreated. Dear Jamie, I'm sorry nobody has it harder than you, that none of us can relate to the oh so pro hard problem of having to wear a mask inside until you were seated at your table. I know this is a difficult time for you, that this is a huge inconvenience for you, but maybe when the pandemic ends, when people are done littering our hospitals with their verge of death sickness, when they stop praying to God to live, when we stop living in fear for our loved ones, when we can finally kiss and hug and stand by side, stand side by side instead of six feet apart, then you won't have to wear a mask inside until you are seated inside the restaurant. Until then, I ask two things of you. Dear Jamie, when you come inside the restaurant, please wear your mask until you are seated at your table. Also, Jamie, shut up. Thank you. Hey. 
Thank you, Destiny. Thank you. I'm wearing one of my favorite masks. This is the mask of Jules Poetry Playhouse in from Placitas, New Mexico. I love this mask. It's super comfortable. So if you want to have a cool poetry playhouse mask, I'll put the chat, the link to the chat where you can order one of these poetry masks in the chat. I hope you can see why I wanted Destiny to come share that message of poetry with us about wearing our masks. Thank you, Destiny. It was just Thank as you. great to hear it the second time as it was to hear it the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me read it. It's so exciting. <laughs> I'm going to take my mask off now. and have just a few final comments for today. Again, I wanna thank our readers. Today you heard from, in our new book showcase, Jan Beatty reading from The Body Wars, Don Krieger reading from Discovery, and Lauren Russell, reading from Descent with our special guest, Destiny Jones, reminding us to wear our Jules Poetry Playhouse masks or other masks. Well, it is, we've had, it's, we've had 11 months of 2020, 11 months down, one more to go. And I hope you'll continue to join us here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry throughout December. Mark your pandemic calendars for next Sunday, December 6th, with the return of our live open mic. Signups will be on Thursday, December 3rd, beginning at 12 noon Pacific on the Cultivating Voices Live group page. All are welcome to join the group and sign up. Eight readers, 10 minute sets a piece. On December 13th, we will have our next new book showcase with Dana Kid Patterson, Jamie McCarty, and Paige Starzinger. And on December 22nd, we will have our first ever Cultivating Voices Live Poetry Virtual Holiday Open House more about the open house soon. Well, that's it for today, friends. I look forward to joining you next week, not from Olympia, Washington, but I will be on the East Coast where I'll be residing in Connecticut for the next two months. I wish a good week to all of you. Stay safe. Take very good care of your beloveds, which of course means wearing your Jules Poetry Playhouse mask. You don't wanna be like Jamie and you, do, you don't want Destiny to write a poem about you not wearing your mask. That's for sure. <laughs> and of course, everyone, look at what happens when we keep writing. Thanks again for being here. We'll see you next time.